in search of soil. For people that might think that, what what are they missing? Maybe like what's the the con argument to a lot of the anti engineering of microbes that you hear? What what part of the picture are they not seeing beyond the obvious benefit? But in terms of the, some of the potential dangers or repercussions, I think that's where people really get scared. Yeah, I think you know. I, it, so I think there's a there's a series of sort of scientific responses that you can give to that. Um, but frankly, the public's not interested in scientific responses. So we, you know, we could get into a discussion about, do you understand um, how often microbes are mutating all the time? All the microbes that are out there, the microbes on your skin, microbes in your gut, all that, right? These microbes are mutating randomly into things that we may not know what they do or don't do. Uh, and, and this is, this has, you know, and this is where some of the concern comes from like disease, you know, pandemics and these things is do things, are things changing out there, not from people doing it, but just natural mutation, natural, natural, uh, evolution that's taking place. The benefit to what we're doing is we're doing it in a very controlled, totally known way. It's very directed. And once we do it, we also can test what happened and know exactly how it behaves, put it through all the safety tests. If it's happening naturally out there in the environment, you have no way of, nobody's, nobody's monitoring that. So in some ways, you by doing it this way, the argument would be you've introduced more control and you're able to do the testing to ensure that you're, that you're doing, you know, you're doing, you're adding benefit, but no harm. The problem with that is that that kind of a science argument totally gets lost on the public. And what you have to do is come back with a more, more of an emotional, more of, more of an emotional type of discussion. And, and it really has to, the story has to start and end with understanding the benefit. Um, and it, it kind of a, an extreme example is um, insulin, insulin for diabetics actually is made from a genetically modified microbe. And, but I will guarantee you that there's no diet, nobody who's diabetic even thinks about the fact that their insulin comes from an engineered microbe because it keeps them alive. I mean, it's just, right, nobody even questions that. Now, you could also make the argument, but wait a minute, that's still in a contained environment. Nobody actually injected the engineered microbe into the diabetic, they actually just took the product. So, you know, there is there is a there is a difference there. And I would say for us, that's really the hurdle. That's one of the hurdles we've got to get over is can we convince people that moving these engineered microbes from a contained environment to out onto a corn seed or out into a wheat field, that that's okay. And the answer, you know, the answer to that has to be partially has to be science driven. We have to run the safety tests, do the studies and answer everybody's questions. But it also, part of it will come in, well, why are you doing it? What problem are you solving? And if the problem you're solving is big enough, I believe people will give, well, it's in those situations that people will turn to new solutions or novel technologies that otherwise they might not be comfortable with. Right. And I guess in the ag side, I mean, one approach is the no synthetic fertilizer side. And I get that approach and how some people make it work. On the other side, it's, well, what's going to do more harm introducing these engineered microbes to the environment or continuing to pour the same amount of synthetic chemicals on the environment and having all the repercussions of that both upstream and downstream figuratively and literally and you just got to say, you know, which one are you more comfortable with? And I, I think a lot of this is just the the unknown, right? Like people, it, it really, we're at a point now in science where a lot of our beliefs and like what even seems possible is being challenged. Like the whole idea of engineering a microbe to fix nitrogen for a corn plant and do most of that in the second half of the corn plant's life and then cease to exist when the corn plant dies. It's really sci-fi. 
to a lot of people. And when you can't understand it, I mean, you have fear and fear is a lot of times based on what's unknown. And, and this is a total unknown for a lot of people. Yeah, I know it's, it's, a, it, 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 it's a great point. And I think it's um, one of the things we've, we've, we've tried to, to think about early in this process is to not just focus on growers. So when, when we go out and talk to growers about this technology and we go out to talk to growers about, okay, what you know, what percent reduction in nitrogen would get you excited economically? Because it, at the end of the day, for growers, you can talk all you want about environmental sustainability, but you also have to be able to talk about economic st- sustainability, right? And those growers are just trying to stay in business. They're trying to make a living, and, and it's getting harder and harder. So whatever solutions you bring them, they need to be economically sustainable as well as environmentally sustainable. <clears throat> and for us, when we, we went out and talked to them, that cutoff points, you know, somewhere around 25, 30% reduction. So once you get above 25, 30% reduction, the economics for that grower get really exciting, get really interesting. So they, from a profitability standpoint, which same as, you know, being economically sustainable. Uh, and that's a, so that's, it's easy to focus on that. However, to, you know, to your point, that's different than what, how the consumer looks at it. The grower and the consumer are two different entities. And I think if you look back on the history of GMOs, it, it, you know, there was a huge focus on growers and little to no focus on consumers. And yet it was the consumers that have ended up being the, the ones who are the most distrustful or having the hardest time with, I would say, genetic engineering technology. And so we're we're really trying hard at this point to, to think about that and think about how to message and think about how to, to talk about it, not just with the grower, but, but also with the consumer. Um, and again, you, you have to go into it recognizing, you know, the, the probability that you're going to get every consumer comfortable with a new technology is zero. There's always, I mean, it, you know, and it, it doesn't matter whether it's vaccine, any, you think about any technology out there. If it's new, there's going to be a percentage of people who, no matter how convincing it is, they're going to be skeptical or concerned, right? And so you have to set your sights on, you have to set your expectations on what you can and can't do there. So, but we're, you know, so we're, we're realistic about it. And it's, it's, uh, it's, it's certainly not a slam dunk. It's not a guarantee, but at the same time, we're, we're so passionate about the potential that we think this approach has. And somebody's got to bring it out there for people to test and see and try. And, and, and if it really does work as well as we think it's going to, then we think there's a path to, with, with the right safety data packages, with the right studies, with the right answers to people's questions, we think there's a path you know, all the way to commercialization and, and actually make, making a difference in ag as a whole from a, from a global perspective. Hi, everybody. Thanks for watching. Subscribe here to get the latest from the show. Also, be sure to check out some of the great clips and watch the full interviews right here on In Search of 